Once, Claire found a baby abandoned in the woods and brought him home, pleading with her parents to take him in. A lawyer called her years later with a shocking surprise for the family. The questions they had been asking for so long were finally answered. Claire begged her parents for a younger sibling for years, but Mark and Cindy were living paycheck to paycheck and couldn't afford to have another child. They couldn't afford to welcome a new member into their family. Cindy didn't wish for her daughter to experience heartbreak or financial anxiety. So, rather than being honest, she told her, if you pray really hard, you might get a little sibling one day. Those words resonated with Claire, and she began praying to God every night before going to sleep, asking for a baby. She vowed to be the best sister ever, and prayed that her prayers would be answered quickly. She was 10 years old and worried it would never happen, but she eventually accepted her situation and was happy with her family. Mark and Cindy cared deeply for her, and their love and happiness endured despite their financial hardships. One day, Claire was skipping home from school, her backpack swinging from side to side. Her mom had figured she was old enough to make the 10-minute trip home on her own. She claimed that the added duty would be worthwhile. As she lived close by, her friend often accompanied her on walks, but not that day. Claire, who was happily skipping along the sidewalk, had her eyes on her shoes and thus failed to notice the stroller that had been left in the middle of the path. She fell, jolting the stroller, and a muffled cry came from within. She mumbled, oh, and leaned in to see a baby boy. His enormous, inquisitive eyes widened. At that point, however, he began to cry out in anguish. She whinnied, hush, and began rocking the stroller from side to side. Thankfully, the infant settled down, and Claire could once again look up and around for his mother. She had found a pleasant community of modest Virginia homes to call home. Most moms walked with their babies in strollers because it was a relatively safe area, but no one would dare to leave a child unattended. Claire scowled at the seemingly abandoned stroller and mused, this is strange. She waited for a while longer, but eventually realized that her mother would become concerned if she didn't return home soon. But she couldn't just abandon the infant in the street like that. Her mother would know what to do if she brought it home, so that was the only choice. Claire, what is that? Cindy asked, drying her hands on a towel as she watched her daughter push a stroller into the house. Mom. This stroller was just lying in the street, and I picked it up. It's a boy baby, but no one was there to see him. It was impossible for me to leave him alone. Rapid fire explanation from Claire. Her mom was clearly shocked and perplexed, but she still picked up the baby and held him close to her heart. Jesus, who would do such a thing? We have to call the police, she said, patting the baby's back. Claire pressed her lips together and looked up hopefully at her mother. I asked my mother, what if he is the brother I've been praying for all these years? The thought crossed my mind, what if he's God's plan for me? What? Sadly, Claire. Not in the way you think. Definitely not. Whether or not he was accidentally abandoned, we must know. Cindy said softly as she rocked the baby, I'm sure his parents are worried sick about him. Claire didn't continue talking, but she did look through the stroller for information. There was a moment of suspense before she uncovered a scrap of paper. There's a letter, Mom. With one hand, Cindy picked up the note and began reading. To whoever finds him, please take care of him. The angel Gabriel is his name. I can't. At the age of 18, I was asked to leave. Please. To whom it may concern, please accept my gratitude. When his mother abandoned him, people asked, what happened to him? She said in disbelief Claire. I think so, sweetie, Cindy said, her eyebrows furrowed in concern. She informed her husband that their infant would need formula because of his age. To save money, he stocked up on food and disposable diapers. They fed him when he got home and dialed the regular phone number. A couple of cops approached and listened to their ordeal. They requested that the family keep the infant overnight, with a social worker picking him up in the morning. However, that night marked a turning point in their lives. What a fantastic angel Gabriel was. In spite of the crying and the poopy diapers, they enjoyed having a baby around. Claire pleaded with her parents one last time before bedtime. To paraphrase, I believe he was sent to us. To put it simply, he's the one I prayed for. She then told them, he's my little brother, before retiring to her bedroom. Mark and Cindy were unable to release their infant to the CPS worker the following day. They had a conversation with her about keeping him safe until the police finished their investigation. The social worker was agreeable provided they completed foster parent training immediately. After several fruitless years, Mark and Cindy finalized their adoption of Gabriel. When Cindy said she would do something, she followed through. She was a wonderful sibling. She took care of her infant and toddler brothers, helping with feedings and diaper changes, and playing with them whenever she could. 
Her parents couldn't afford a sitter, so she was the primary caregiver for her younger siblings. Even though money was tight, they were happy. They may as well have believed that God or whoever that poor mother was had sent Gabriel to them. Claire, who was 19 at the time, was attending a nearby university while still living at home. She worked part-time, but prioritized her time with her almost 10-year-old brother. At some point, she heard her landline ring and went to answer it. She waved at her brother and said, hello? Before running over to join the Monopoly game. Greetings, is this Cindy I speak with? A man's voice asked. Saying, no, this is Claire. She said, Cindy is my mom. Just as well. In this case, you shall suffice. Hello, my name is Mr. Cohen. A lawyer for Suzanne Masters, he said. After a moment of thought, Claire frowned. That person was completely unknown to her. Okay. Just who is that? Ignore that. I'm calling to let you know that in her will, Ms. Masters has left $2.7 million to you and your brother Gabriel. Mr. Cohen has suggested that you and your parents come to my office soon to sign the papers. Seeing this, Claire's mouth dropped open. What? Obviously, there was some sort of misunderstanding. Just who are you? Where did you hear about us? Mr. Cohen said, I suggest you call this number, and began reciting a string of numbers that Claire wrote down as fast as she could. To paraphrase, you'll get the information you require. Please have everyone gather at my office so I can get things set up. Until we meet again, miss. But before Claire could continue, the lawyer hung up. The girl was at a loss for what to do. She had no siblings or other relatives who could leave her parents an inheritance, but their financial situation had improved over the years. They came from a family of regular folks. This was an illogical phone call. That said, it must be right. In her presentation, the lawyer mentioned her brother. Since she felt she needed to know the truth about the situation immediately, she dialed the number. When Claire introduced herself, a frail female voice said, Hello Claire. Presumably, Mr. Cohen has already called you. In other words, it's not a lie. That cash is going to you. Is that you Suzanne? Yes. What's your name? For what reason are you providing us with financial support? Some years ago, my parents kicked me out of the house because I moved back in with my child. They had no idea I was pregnant, and their reaction was ire. It would have been embarrassing for them to have a child by an unmarried daughter of 18, Suzanne began, and Claire plopped down on the couch, finally understanding what was going on. She covered her mouth and mumbled, oh my god. Yes, it was me. I am Gabriel's biological mother, and I followed you home in the stroller while you hid behind a tree. All of it was in front of my eyes. I was already aware of his whereabouts. I have carried this weight of sorrow with me for all these years. I felt powerless without my parents' approval, so I had no choice but to give him up. A promise of return was made if I turned him in. For lack of courage, I did it and went back home. Suzanne's story was repeatedly paused by coughing fits. All right, so what's going on right now? Fearing that she was coming to take Gabriel back or offer the money for him, Claire asked. The lawyer had assured her that the funds were intended for both of them, so her concerns were unfounded. When I abandoned my child on your street, my parents were killed in a car accident a few years later, and I inherited everything they had. I was hoping to win back my boyfriend, but I noticed how contented you seemed. A family you were. In your heart, he was the one. I stood on the sidelines, unable to participate. I just couldn't do it. It would have been a catastrophe because by then your parents had already adopted him, so I avoided the situation. And now you're giving us money? Why me? I'm not. The rest of my inheritance will be given to your family at a later date, Suzanne said. I have the flu Claire. Since my time here is limited, I accept that surrendering him was God's plan. He has always belonged with you and your loved ones. You'll be receiving the entirety of my wealth very soon. No, there must be something you can do. To which Claire replied, with all that money, you can pay for the best doctors, because she was at a loss for words. Although she had never met Gabriel's biological mother, she considered her a member of the family nonetheless. It's not that Claire. It just can't happen. Please have your parents call me, I'd like to personally thank them for taking in my son as well. After chatting for a while, they hung up, but Claire said she'd have her parents call. It occurred that evening. Before thanking Cindy and Mark, Suzanne explained her situation to them. The whole truth was revealed to Gabriel some time later. Even though he knew he was adopted, the young boy was stunned by this revelation. They had planned to meet Suzanne, but she passed away just a few days after that phone call. Over time, they not only received the $2.7 million Suzanne had promised, but also additional funds, such as a trust fund for Gabriel and a large house in a posh neighborhood of their town. 
Now that they weren't constantly concerned about money, the dynamic in their family could relax a bit, but only after much effort. Together, they did some things. Both Cindy and Mark continue to put in long hours at work, and they have put most of their savings away for the future. Claire always knew that Gabriel was the answer to her fervent pleading as a child, even if others didn't see it that way. After researching Suzanne, however, she realized she had been right all along. As fate would have it, it did. The youngest sibling was both her closest confidant and favorite sibling. 